Marshall. Samuel Clemens, better known by his pen name, Mark Twain, had a long love affair with the Mississippi River. Glowing with sparkling remembrance, he has claimed, considering the Missouri, its main branch, it is the longest river in the world, 4,300 miles. The Mississippi is remarkable in another way. It is always moving its habitat bodily, always moving sideways. Remember that and listen. That is the reason for the ring on the finger. The ring? So that if one should wake and twitch, the dead bell would ring. What a fearful bell. If you were a corpse and woke back to life in the dead house, you might not hear it that way. mystery drama, The Dead House, was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Leon Janney and Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. American history, possibly nothing has been more romantic than the sailing of a Mississippi River boat. From an hour before sailing, they would be burning pitch and rosin, and from the double smokestacks, columns of coal black smoke would rise and hang in the air like the flags flying from the jackstaffs. The last bells would clang out over the end of feverish loading. The gangways were snatched away. The majestic boat moves out into the stream. This is the world Mark Twain wrote about 21 years after being a riverboat pilot. And this is one of the stories he tells of that voyage. Welcome aboard, sir. I thank you, Captain. I have just turned over the boat to the pilot. I'm surprised you didn't make straight for the pilot house the moment you came aboard. Why, I considered it closed to ordinary passengers. Oh, indeed it is. But you're not going to try to hoodwink me and tell me that you are any ordinary passenger. Well, just a poor scribbler and indifferent journalist who hopes to make a chronicle of the voyage, which perhaps might make a book. Oh, you think our voyage might provide you with enough incident for that? It is my hope. Well, why don't you go on up to the pilot house where you can swap told stories with a master? I'm hoping to run this trip incognito. Sam, it's up to you. If you want my pledge, no one should know you're aboard, you have it. I thank you for that. Uh, how far will you be going with us? Uh, uh, all the way to New Orleans? Well, I'd like to, for old time's sake, but no, not near as far. Yeah, just tell me your port of call and we'll set you down easy. I'll let you know in time to bring her to shore. So, once again, I was aboard a paddle steamer going down the Mississippi. But since I wanted to observe and report, I needed to remain objective. And then there was my special errand. I suppose I might as well drift into that history now. Toward the end of the previous year, I had been in Germany, in Munich, spending some time there with the hope of polishing my proficiency in the language. I am an incurable rambler, and during one of my wanderings, I visited the dead house. An establishment where the government keeps and watches corpses until they decide that they are permanently dead and not in a trance. It was a grisly place that I shared with 36 corpses and the old lady who watched over them. Can I here help, mein Herr? I entschuldige mir. Ich kann einzig klein Deutsch sprechen. 
Ich bin Amerikanischer. So, we can speak English if you will. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, to whom do I speak? I am the Frau Dahlweiner, now a widow. What brings you to the Schermittig place? Schermittig? That means in English what? Uh, uh, sad, melancholy? Yeah, melancholy. Uh. Here are the poor on these boards. No one mourns or cares for them. Well, they're wrapped in shrouds, so they must be dead. Perhaps. Who is dead and who is alive? These are the doctor's choices. <laughs> and the doctor is only a man. That is the reason for the ring on the finger. The ring? To which the wire is attached, which mounts to the ceiling, and so back into the watch room where it is attached to the dead bell. A uh, bell? So that if one should revive and twitch or move, the dead bell would ring. And we shall know that they are not dead. Oh, how strange. What a fearful bell. Oh, if you were a corpse and woke back to life in the dead house, you might not hear it that way. It's fascinating. Uh, may I ask more questions? Your English is very good. Oh, my lodger has taught it to me. He is an American. Uh, here in Munich? Yes. If you are staying here, would you not like to come and see him? He is very ill. Perhaps you can raise his spirits. He knows far more of this fearful place than I do. This watchman's job was his before he took sick. Well, I don't know. I, I shall be leaving Munich shortly. Oh, such a short walk. And it would mean so much to him. Surely... A man needs some warmth from some fire if he is about to die. I had simply thought, of course, that I was making a good Samaritan's trip. And from my first meeting, nothing should have changed that thought. He was a living man, but he did not look it. Propped on the pillows, his face was wasted. His hand on his breast, so emaciated, it was like a talon. As Frau Dahlweiner began her introduction, his eyes opened slowly and glittered wickedly from the twilight of their caverns. Oh, Herr Ritter, here's Herr Clemens come to meet you. Uh, <coughs> Now, now, Herr Ritter, that is no way to treat a stranger in our country, an American besides. American, is it? Yes, that's right. What brings you to see me? The gentleman came to see you at, at my request. I thought to talk to an American again would lift your spirits. There's no can do that. An American? From where in America? Well, I was brought up in Hannibal, Missouri. Missouri? State next to Arkansas. You wouldn't know Mariana, no? I do, for a fact. Then that would make us neighbors. Oh, I, I think I should leave you two gentlemen alone. I'll make some coffee while you get acquainted. Oh, danke. Never mind the coffee. Would you say we were neighbors? Well, not quite. Hannibal is north of St. Lou. Mariana, a piece far south. Every 450 miles, the crow flies from Hannibal to Mariana. But near twice that far by the river. Uh, the Mississippi. The Mississippi. You know that river? Yes, I know it. Once upon a time, like the palm of my hand, and better. How come? Up to 21 years ago, I was a riverboat pilot. But I left the river. You don't make your home there anymore? No. My home now is in Hartford, Connecticut. So, you don't ever expect to go back west, eh? Oh, sure I do. When I return to the States, the first thing I plan to do is to go back and take a journey down the Mississippi. See if I even recognize her anymore. What do you mean? Mr. Ritter, 
There never was a woman as fickle, as flighty as the Mississippi. Why, that river can make prodigious jumps almost by night. And by cutting through narrow necks of land, straighten and shorten itself and change the shape of the country. A man could go to sleep one night in the state of Mississippi and wake up to find himself in Louisiana the next morning. I know. Well, you worked on the river. No, but I sure made use of it. Oh, how's that? Oh, when I was young, I was a hell of a fighting, drinking, gambling man. And then when I had a little money and a rage to settle down at last, I, I bought me some land in Arkansas to sheep and settled in to make a homestead. But I was too far from the river for it to pay, so I... I... So you made a cut. <laughs> I guess I, I can afford to admit it now. No human laws are going to catch up with me anymore. Yes, sir. On a dark night when the river was rising fast, I cut me a little gutter across the nickel land. I don't have to tell you what happened. <laughs> In no time at all, old lady Mississippi wrought a miracle. Uh, the whole river took possession of that little ditch and put your plantation flat on its bank. Well, the other party's property became an island that shoaled up so no boat could get within ten miles of it. And by as much as his property went down, mine went up. If you'd been caught cutting that ditch, they'd have tarred and feathered you and strung you from a tree. In a lot of ways, I might have been better off. Well, why'd you do it? Was money all that important to you? It was, and it wasn't. Oh, that's a little cryptic. I don't quite follow that. I sold the land. For a handsome profit. $25,000. Why? <laughs> that's a fortune. I know. The trouble was that you and I are not alone in recognizing it. Well, what do you mean by that? I never told this to another living soul. I never thought I would. But now I must, if you will help me... But for today, I, I'm too worried to tell you the story, and I, I still must think on whether I can trust the stranger. Could you, oh, well, could you come back tomorrow? Well, I, I, I'm not sure. You must. I... You have to hear my story. You cannot refuse the request of a dying man. You, you were a miracle sent by God, the only man who can bring me salvation, who can save my soul. <laughs> And with these words, according to Mark Twain's story, the dying man fell back on the bed, asleep or in some sort of coma. In haste, Mark Twain fetched the widow and left the man in her care, troubled in his mind as to whether it would be in Ritter's best interest or his own to return. I shall be back with his decision shortly. No one has said it, someone should have. Words to this effect. Unless you are a priest or a doctor, avoid the confession of a dying man. He is only trying to transfer the cross from his shoulders to yours. In that early winter of 1883, Mark Twain, living in Munich, Germany, or as it was then Bavaria, fell into this trap. <laughs> I could have taken to my heels and run. Then again, the incurable curiosity of the author beckoned me to stay. I could not resist. I had to hear the dying man's confession. I have never given up before, but last night I did. I know I'm going to die. You say you are going to revisit your river. If you do... You will see Napoleon, Arkansas, and I ask you when you are there to do a certain thing for me. I can make no promises. I ask none. Only the dictates of your conscience. Now come back with me all those years towards the end of the war between the states. Here's what happened. And I guess the way you'd have to understand it best is to meet Nell. 
do you like it, Mrs. Ritter? It's heaven. I just want it to go on and on and never end. That's the way I hope to make life for you, Nell. Uh, uh, how soon do we get to Napoleon, Carl? How uh, soon would you like to? Well, you know the answer to that. I, I want to be home. I don't want you to get two grand expectations. It's just a place I built myself. But it's good enough for the two of us right now. Oh, it, it won't be for long. No, Nell. Carl? I never promised you no mansion or... Hey, wait a minute. What do you mean it won't be for long? Can't you guess? You mean you... you... You're expecting... Well, it'll take a doctor to know for sure, but... I don't have any doubts. Why, honey, we only got married a little over two months ago. It, it don't take that long, Carl, when a woman's got herself a man like you and has a strong desire to make him a family. Oh, Nell. <laughs> Nell, I love you. Like I love you. Just give me the chance and I'll make a home big enough for you to be proud of. And... Big enough to bring up as many young'uns as you could want. If the war don't interfere... It won't. Not for me. I don't belong on either side. Don't you worry, Nell. What? What's that? That's saying to Napoleon, steamboat are coming. We'd best get ready to land. Well, is it very far to Mariana from there? Well, no. Just a piece south and inland. It's not on the river? You want to be on the river, honey, that's where you'll be. By the time you have your firstborn. I started digging my ditch within a month after we settled in. And the first thing in early spring when the waters began to rise, I opened up the end of it to the river. So by the time my daughter was born, I was able to give her the best present in the world. Carl! Carl! I'm coming, Nell. You all right? Where's the midwife? Oh, well, she, she's gone. I left you alone? Oh, I'm fine. Don't you worry about me? Oh, darling, don't you want to see your daughter? Oh, I sure do. Oh, so beautiful. And she's the spitting image of you. Where were you? Why weren't you here when she was born? I couldn't bear to see you hurting, Nell. Oh, silly. That's a woman's lot. And isn't it worth it to bring something like this into the world? <laughs> you know what we're going to call her? No, what? Missy. Missy? Where did you get it from? From the present I promised you with your firstborn. Right almost in your front yard. Here, let me help you oh. sit up. Yeah. Nell, look. Where? Well, what's happened down there at the end of the slope? The fields are all gone. And it looks like... Like water. That's not just any water, Nell girl. That's the Mississippi flowing right through our front yard. Oh, oh you, you promised me a river and, and you brought it to me. That's not the only thing, Nell. It's going to make us rich. And in the next two years, Mr. Clemens, it did make us rich. In money, but not all the way in happiness. It was a lonely place, and except for the river, isolated from people. Uh, it was a bad time. The war was over, and renegade soldiers dressed as tramps and such were plundering the land. They all were scared of them. I should have listened to her sooner than I did, but I moved too late. I sold the property, and there was over 25000 in cash gold the night they came. I woke from a deep sleep to find myself bound and gagged in the air, tainted with chloroform. It was black as a witch's pocket. Somewhere far off, I heard the baby crying in my wife's voice. Don't hold me, please. Oh, my baby. I told you where the money is. Hold your hand, lady. 
Now all that's left is to shut your mouth forever. Shut that kid up. No, please. You said no violence. Group C is moving out. The road of the river is alive with soldiers. We can't be caught. And if it won't shut its mouth, I will shut it for it. Let me go, woman! Now, shut that kid. You... You killed my baby! You assassin, I'll kill you for that! I told you, woman, get get out of here! You said no violence! You said we'd only gag them, not hurt them. Or I would not have come. Shut up. I had to change our plan when they waked up. You've done all you could to protect them. Let that, that satisfy you. You will leave the woman and the baby alone now? Of course. And uh, what about him? He might be playing possum. We should club him. No. No more clubbing. Suppose he could recognize us. He can't. We put him to sleep with the chloroform. Besides, it is pitch black in here. Okay, trooper, okay. We will take the chance. We have got some money, so strike a light so we can see to get out of here. I had no way to stop them. I couldn't move. The gag was so stifling that when I tried to speak, I could make no sound. It was dawn before I managed to wriggle free. And staggering to the other side of the room, I found my wife and daughter. Alive? No, Mr. Clemens, dead. There they lay, the poor unoffending ones, their troubles ended. When mine had just begun. Did you go to the law? (laughs) No law of gallows could pay the debt that was owing me. How could you expect to take matters into your own hands? If it was so dark, you couldn't identify the man. I had some clues, Mr. Clemens. I heard their voices. And when they lit the match to see their way out, the hand that held it was missing a thumb. And when I went to the place my money had been hidden among the papers tossed around was one containing a bloody thumbprint. Well, what use could the last piece of information be to you? The man without the thumb was the one who had begged his companion should not hurt us. If the print on the paper belonged to the other man, I could identify him definitely enough to kill him. The man's thumbprint is the one sure proof of his identity. Well, still in all, grant that to be true. How could you go about a search for these passing traps? Remember my story. The one I knew I must kill someday had said, Troop C is moving out. We can't be caught. And also he called his companion Trooper. Then you think they were soldiers? A few miles away, two companies of U.S. cavalry were billeted. Company A was stationary, but Company C had been ordered 50 miles north to Napoleon. And you followed them? Yeah. With what money I had left, I made a disguise for myself out of odds and ends of clothing after I had buried my wife and daughter. By the time I reached Napoleon, I had a new trade. I had become a fortune teller. Did you find your men? It didn't take me long to find the one who lacked the thumb. His name was Kruger. He was a German, one of nine in the company. And the only one who had suffered such a wound. The only one. Besides, I recognized that whining voice. But he was not my prey. It was the other. So how did you locate the other? As a fortune teller, I would pass each client a sheet of paper daub his thumb with red paint and take a print. It wasn't until the 43rd member of the troop visited me for a reading that I found my man. How? I poured over the print of the ball of his thumb with a magnifying glass one whole night. It matched the bloody print left on the paper rifled from secret cash exactly. So you 
took the law into your own hands. Not yet. I had to be totally sure. So I went to Kruger. He was the weak link. He was a superstitious little coward. If I broke him, then I could be sure. Why did you have to drag me down here by the river to this Lord Forsaken spot for? I have been rereading your fortune, and a part of it is so grave, it can't be said in public. Well, well what part? What, what? You and another man, whose fortune I also was studying last night, have murdered a woman and a child. Ah! Uh, no! The palm does not lie. The truth is not to be hidden. Your companion's name was Franz Adler. Ah! Uh, how did you know that? Who are you? What's the matter, Kruger? Was it too dark in that cabin for you to remember the man whose wife and child you slaughtered? Wait, well, it was pitch black. We were only shadows. If I don't remember you, how can I you... could feel but... you were missing a thumb. Well, uh, no, I, I didn't do it. Franz did. I tried to stop him, but I was too late for your wife and the baby. But I made him leave you alone. I saved your life. Now, please, please, don't, don't, don't kill me. I have no intention of killing you. Well, but is it that you want the money? Yes. Why? I don't have it. He took it from me. He has it hidden away. Then let him find it and bring it to me. Not you. Him. At this spot tonight at the stroke of twelve. Yeah, but how can I be sure? You had better be sure. But the sentries... If I... I can avoid them, so can he. If not, I promise you, you will die. I have read it in your palm. Oh, no, 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 please. I don't want to die. Then have him meet me here at midnight. Tell him to come by horse and bring the money in the saddlebags. Otherwise, I shall go to the authorities and see you both hung. The man was a coward, Mr. Twain, and superstitious to his roots. I knew my revenge was near at last, and I could taste the sweetness of it. I settled down by the riverbank to wait for the murderer. <laughs> this moment in his story, Mark Twain reports that the dying man sagged back against his pillows, gasping for breath, as though in his last throes. Was he going to be able to finish his story? I'm afraid, like Mark Twain, we're going to have to wait until I return with Act Three. Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, by the bedside of a dying man whose story he later penned and made immortal. Exhausted by his narrative and the reliving of his tragic life, the man had sunk back against his pillows, fighting for breath. Aware that every breath may well be the man's last, Mark Twain leans over him anxiously. Mr. Ritter. Mr. Ritter. I'm not done yet. I have to tell you the rest so I can make my request. Uh, it might be better if I fetch a doctor. <laughs> no doctor can do anything for me now. I don't know if you should tax your strength. What other use have I for it? It won't keep me alive any more than I had determined Franz Adler would live beyond the moment I saw him. I wanted to watch his face to glow as he struggled in the death agony to savor my revenge for my wife and child that he had killed. But that was to be denied me. He didn't meet the appointment? Oh, yes. He came. But before midnight, the moon had gone behind heavy clouds. And the night was as pitch black as the night he had come to my cabin. I lay hidden in the mangrove and watched him come on horseback. All I could see was a silhouette and the bulging saddlebags. My knife 
was my hand. As he passed me, with one leap, I was on him and had him dragged off his horse. And then all the plans went wrong. Instead of being the ambusher, I was ambushed. I drove my knife straight up through his belly, under the rib cage, and into his heart. He was dead before he could cry out. And I had my own life to think of. I mounted the plunging horse. And when the shots rang out, I clapped my heels to him and fled. So, you had your revenge. I thought so. Though I was cheated out of the money. Oh, how so? By dawn, I had to rest the horse and myself. But when I stripped the saddle and looked in the bags, there wasn't any money. They were stuffed with sage grass and the like. Did you go back for it? And put my neck in a noose? No. Besides, I didn't care all that much. About $25,000? It was blood money. If I hadn't cheated to get it in the first place, my wife and child might be alive today. Besides, the first man, Kruger, had double-crossed me. You could be sure he had picked up the money, deserted and faded out of sight as I did. Well, how did you fade out of sight? How did Kruger? That's one part of the story. For the moment, the way I did was to beat my way to New Orleans. Ship on board as a hand before the mast stagger across the world waiting only for death. Two years ago, my health began to fail. And in my purposeless way, I had wandered here into Munich. I had no money, sought work, and was hired to be the night watchman in the dead house you have just visited. I liked it. I felt I belonged among the dead. Then one night, alone in the watch room, cold, numb, comfortless, the incredible happened. Over my head, the dead bell rang. It was the first time I had ever heard it. For a moment, I was almost paralyzed, and I pulled myself together and ran to the corpse room. On the board table, one of the shrouded corpses wagging its head from side to side was sitting up. <laughs> It's all right. I, I, I'm here. Are you really alive? Oh, yes, but I am bound. I can't move. I can't, can't talk. Give me all of this. Who, who are you? What does this matter? I am in Franz Adler. If you must know. Franz Adler? But you can't be. You are dead. dead. Not dead yet, as you can see. After 17 years. Oh, what are you talking about? I was only knife last night. Get me out of this bond. Yes, yes. Uh, first, let me strip the winding cloth from your face. Uh, 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 yes, uh, yes. Uh, that is good. Uh, good. <laughs> no. Uh, it is you. The same Franz Adler. What is the matter with you, fool? Unwind the rest of these bandages so I can move. I am dying. Have mercy. Did you have mercy 20 years or so ago when you murdered my wife and my baby? What, what, are, what are you talking about? Napoleon, do you remember the town in America? Where you and Kruger were stationed as you served your time in the U.S. Cavalry? How, how could you know about that? You murdered my wife and baby. You? Oh, the, the thoughts and dead, The one who drove poor Kruger out of his mind. I had a rendezvous with you by the Mississippi River. Do you remember that? Uh, yes, yes, I remember. I thought I killed you there, Adler. No man could have lived after the way I sank my knife. You are right. And why are you here and still alive? Because you killed the wrong man. 
It was Kruger you drove your knife into. I was stunned. My whole life fell away from under me. I looked at the ghastly specter in front of me, his whole body swathed in bandages, helpless. My prisoner... All through his stammered explanations, the one inflexible thought in my mind was, You escaped me once. You won't escape this time. Please, please, what, what do you want of me? I want to know how you're still alive. When I killed you all those years ago. You, you talked to that fool Kruger. You scared him half to death. Uh, he, he came to me saying that I had to meet you by the river with the money. But you sent him instead? He had no choice. He knew I would kill him unless he obeyed. Poor silly little man caught between forces he could not handle. So you double-crossed him, too, and allowed me to kill him first. What do you mean, first? Before you started shooting and trying to kill me. No, 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 no. That, that was the watch patrol. Don't lie to me. Was... Only one person was firing. You would have killed me with as little compunction as you killed my wife and my baby. No, no, that was an accident. Look, please, help me out of here. I, I, I... I can make you rich again. How? The money, the, the twenty-five thousand dollars, your money. It isn't all spent by now. No, no, no. It is still hidden where it was seventeen years ago. You didn't take it and spend it. When Kruger was found dead, I was arrested for his murder. I managed to escape from the army stockade and flee America back to Germany. I, I never had a, a, a chance to pick up the money. The money poor Kruger thought he was bringing me in the saddlebags. Uh, yes, he, he was a, a fool. But we, we, we have not. Huh? We, we are men. We, we can make a bargain. What bargain? Yeah, and loose me from these bandages. Set me free. And I will tell you where to find the money. How can I trust you? You can trust me. As much as you trust me? Uh, yes, yes. All right. First, where's the money? It is in, in the town of Napoleon. As a corner... Wait, wait, not so fast. Let me... Let me write this down. Napoleon, yes. Corner of the... Uh... The corner of Orleans and Market. Mm -hmm. A brick livery stable. Yes. A cut a corner from the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Third stone, mm -hmm. fourth... Fourth row, behind the oh, God, this house. Help me out of the bandages. Why? I need the doctor. Or I will die. But you are here in the dead house. You are already dead. No, no, I ran the dead bell. In all the years in this dead house, the dead bell has never rung. But I didn't hear it ring. You, you came in answer to it. Did I? Yeah, and we, we made the bargain. Please, I, I, I told you where the money is. You, you can have it back. Can I have my wife back? Or my baby daughter? You've, you've got to hurt me. I will. I caught you escaping from the grave. This time I intend to make sure that you will be thrust into it forever. He had a long, hard death of it. I sat and watched him all the time. It was all of three hours and six minutes from the time he rang the bell. That's a terrible story. I'm sorry you told me all this. I had to... To be sure you would do me this last favor. And what is that? Yeah. Uh, take this. Please. What is it? It's the directions where to find the money. In Napoleon, Mr. Clemens. You expect to be there in the next year. I want you to find it. And send it... <coughs> Uh, I'll send it to you? No. I shall be gone by then. 
After Adler died, I spent some months making inquiries. Kruger's death was very much on my mind. I found he had a son, a shoemaker at number 14 Königstrasse, Mannheim. A widower with some young children. I want the money to go to him as some amends. The man did try to save my wife and child's life. It was a poor recompense for me to, even in accident, take his life. <laughs> man was dead and he had laid on me a heavy burden within the next year here I was on the Mississippi nearing Napoleon with my scribbled directions of how to find a foot I was far from morally sure anyone should own but willy nilly I was cursed with having to make that decision Miss Clemens, you've been a stranger during the voyage. We're approaching a landfall I must make. I don't know if it's a regular port of call for you. Well, where might that be? Napoleon. Na Napoleon? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You, you, you wish me to land you there? <laughs> Have you any objection? Me? For myself? No. But I just don't hardly know how I could go about it. What do you mean? Well, about seven years ago, the Arkansas River crested and bust right through Napoleon, tore it all to rags, and emptied it into the Mississippi. Why, right this moment, the boat is paddling dead center over where the town used to be. There just isn't that in Napoleon anymore. No secret cabin. And a way out from under a promise I never should have made. I've always loved the Mississippi. And I love her still. Among all her other virtues, the lady knows how to bury her dead. story related by a master storyteller sandwiched among fact and fiction in Mark Twain's account of his return to the Mississippi is it true I can only quote Mr. Twain himself I was gratified to be able to answer promptly and I did I said I didn't know I'll be back shortly Samuel Langhorn Clemens. Under either name, he is one of America's immortals. Changing times may make succeeding generations less aware of him, but somewhere, always, there will be those to rediscover him and not allow him to die, as he himself was unwilling to when in reply to a false news story, he sent the famous cable to the New York press. The reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. Our cast included Leon Janney, Bryna Rayburn, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.